think, Mr. Chairman, it, it, what you were talking about here, um, I don't know if I should start going down this road, but let me quickly do it. And uh, why, have, why have we not gotten there yet? I, I think most people feel like they would pay something extra. If I didn't have to remember all my passwords, I would pay something extra for that. If I could use a fingerprint, if I had, you know, if I could go purchase something, plug it in the USB port, put my, use my fingerprint, I get into How come it hasn't happened yet uh, up, up to this point? If you could be, if anyone has a very brief answer to why, to this, so we can move on. Mr. Mayors? Um, one of the things I would observe is that many applications are, are kind of stovepiped. The applications that you, that you um, um, access on a daily basis, and they don't share um, authentication data from one to the next. And so there is no real uniform way of communicating between those. So it leads to this stovepipe approach that doesn't lend itself to what we look for as unitary, we call a unitary logon, the convenience of having one logon with security, including biometrics, that gives you access to multiple different types of applications. Uh, in government services, the migration to the cloud, cloud computing, actually helps security and helps that convenience because it puts those apps within a cloud community that has a security structure that is amenable to unitary logon. And so you are going to see advancements as a result of that. But I think, in short, that is the reason. Okay. And, and the, but if Apple comes out with this uh, fingerprint reader on the, the new iPhone, how does that uh, get past that, that issue? Well, certainly for the apps that we all know and love on our mobile phones, uh, it can be an enabler that will be accessed for those apps. Um, my comment was more to the large uh, IT systems that um, reside elsewhere, per perhaps in government service. But for the app side of it, it will s definitely drive convenience. Okay. Let me move on to or Dr. Shuckers, you want to add something quickly? Well, I was just going to say the, the end stick is also creating this independent private identity broker. And through that brokerage, you can be, that can be your interface to all of those places where you need to provide that password. And so that is an enabler, essentially, to get at what you want. Um, so the phone can provide it, but really you also need that broker who can say to this application, yes, that this is the right person to get access without giving all the information away, right? They just, they you authenticate with them, like a PayPal but an expanded sort of PayPal. And how far are we away from that? Dr. Maybe that would be appropriate. Well, the NSTIC program is relatively new. The, the, uh, uh, the, the grants that have, uh, have gone out are in their first year of full uh, gear up. Uh, but I would say we are optimistic uh, that the program, which is uh, slated to be essentially a five-year program, will, uh, will actually catalyze a lot of, uh, of what uh, Dr. Shuckers was talking about with regard to establishing that ecosystem that is interoperable with the pillars of privacy, transparency, usability, and, and so on uh, as a driver. Thank you. Another question, Dr. Shucker, you had talked about in your testimony that uh, biometrics relies on uniqueness and permanence. Um, it also states that much of the funding for biometrics is focused on near-term implementation challenges and more research is needed to provide a foundation for biometrics. Can you? Uh, Describe the foundational research that, that's needed and uh, which biometric traits are more stable over time, which are more unique. How do you find that, how do you find that balance? Yes, thank you. So we think of biometrics as all being equal. Um, you know, you hear people say, look, this is a biometric, X is a biometric, and, and really biometrics isn't that way because it has these two fundamental properties which you highlighted, uniqueness and permanence. And so uniqueness has to do with how, what's your ability to distinguish n individuals, and a thousand individuals, a million individuals. And, and so if we talk about the uniqueness aspects, we think of DNA as kind of one echelon. Then the next echelon would be finger, where 10 fingerprints is a better able to distinguish um, people than one fingerprint. We look at iris. I, an iris would be equivalent to a fingerprint, two irises to multiple fingerprints. And then we have other levels of, of, of things like voice recognition and face recognition and all the emerging biometrics. And so this is where the research is, is to understand 
what the capability is and how it fits into the application. If you're doing a one-on-one -on -one transaction in your phone, for the most part, your phone only sees you on a regular basis and you want to protect, you might not need one in a billion kind of accuracy. You may, may be satisfied with one in a thousand because you get more convenience. Um, the other aspect is the permanence, and the permanence has to do with does the biometric vary over time? We all know our face varies over time. And so that's the other kind of study. So essentially, the biometrics are changing. We want diversity in the biometric market to look at different applications of biometrics, but we need to understand what its capabilities are so we can weigh them depending on the application. Thank you. Thank you.